I do have it going on Facebook now and people are tuning in there as well. So welcome to part two of our stockpile grazing mix. Uh, as Dale and I were going through the slides last week, just kind of realized this is a bigger topic than what we can cover in 45 minutes. So thanks for just joining us. We're going to pretty much just kick off right where we left off, I believe. And so for those who are tuning in, you guys are all muted uh, as always, but go ahead and ask your questions in the chat bar. And Keith is available there. He is, he's gone dark. He's in the shadows, but he will answer any questions you guys have. Uh, and we'll also open it up to any questions at the last about 15 minutes. We'll go till about 6.15 and then allow you guys to ask your questions. So Dale, I'm going to go ahead and change this so that you can share your screen. I'm gonna okay. see if you're able to do that real quick. Yep. Okay. Okay. We are, there we go. Okay, and I am going to put this in presentation mode. I have to admit, looking, okay. <clears throat> looking through your slides before we actually knew what was going on, I had so many questions. So I'm <laughs> very curious to see how these tie into uh, stockpile grazing. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, let's, well, let's just get cranking then. Um, and my goal today, and last week we talked, I mean, pretty specifically about using stockpiled sorghums to cut the cost of wintering livestock. And today I want to, I really want to do some, talk about some things. It's just going to expand your thought processes about why we do what we do and what are the drawbacks of doing what we do and why, why do we, what are some alternatives to what we ordinarily just do. And so my goal here is really, we're going to touch on a lot of different things, uh, but the main goal is just to stimulate th your thought processes and I just want to do some mind expansion. And, and when we get done, my goal is for, for your head to look like this. And so um, I want to start with just this a story here. Um, this is uh, a mother and daughter, one of my cattle from, oh gosh, 15 years ago, I guess. It's about when this was. And um, that calf had a 900 pound, actually there are four calves in my herd that had a, a 900 pound average weaning weight. And that seems really impressive. And it sounds like I'm doing a bit of bragging. But in a minute, you're going to hear the rest of the story. So Picking up where we left off last week, and last week I talked about how 80% of total cost for running a reproductive pastured livestock operation revolve around providing feed, and most of that feed is for winter feed. 80% of your total costs are feed related, 80% of those feed costs are winter feed related. And so you look at all the expenses we have in providing feed for our livestock. And <coughs> what do you use that machinery for? And you know, making hay and feeding hay. It seems like if you have have uh, pastured livestock, you spend all summer making hay. You spend all winter feeding hay. And one of the things that has really changed and uh, has changed much faster than our mindset in agriculture is that. It used to be the harder you worked, the more successful you became. But now I'm not so sure that the harder you work, the less money you make because so much of our work now is done with machinery. And every hour you put on machinery costs you money. And sometimes the value of what we create with that hour of machinery time is less than the cost of operating that machinery. And that is, is very counterintuitive. You know, you think you can just keep working harder and work yourself out of a hole 
sometimes the harder you work, the deeper you dig that hole. If you are burning up more machinery costs than what you are creating during that machinery time. So let, let's take a look. What does it cost for you to produce hay? And I, I just got these figures from the uh, K-State Extension uh, uh, custom rates book. So these are custom rates. And, um, you know, and you can add them all up and compare them to your own operation if you keep records. This is much, much higher than what most people assume it costs them to make a bale of hay. You say, well, it doesn't cost me that because I own all my own equipment. I said, well, actually, if you listen to any good ag economist, they will tell you that if the, the average number of bales made by the respondents in this was about 2,000 bales per year. If you are producing, and because your machinery costs are spread over your number of bales, if you're making less than 2,000 bales a year, your costs are probably much higher than what these are. Now, most people do have somewhat of a grasp of what it costs to make hay. But where people don't figure is how much it costs them to feed the hay itself. And that's the value of the hay plus the depreciation, interest, fuel, repairs, labor, insurance involved in the feeding process. And I went through this calculation one time, figured up the actual cost. A guy told me that he could dry lot cattle for $1.50 a day. And I asked him what all is in that. And he said, the hay and the silage. I said, well, what about your machinery cost now? Well, cost something, but not that much. When we figured it up, after you figured in his machinery cost, his cost per day was $5.31 a day. He actually had twice as much, more than twice as much expense involved in the feeding of the hay than he had in the hay and silage itself. And that's the invisible cost, the hole in the bucket that, that most people don't ever really realize Every hour of runtime on that machinery costs you money. You've got depreciation. And, and I, I just figured on, on one of my tractors that I own, that was $10 an hour. The interest, you know, whether you are uh, buy machinery on a note or if you could have used that cash uh, to pay off other uh, loans or, in, or invest it and, and get a return off of it, it costs you money. Fuel five gallons per hour uh, of runtime, that cost you money. Repairs, and boy, I tell you what, uh, you don't have to pay very many repair bills, uh, parts and labor, before you figure out that this is a huge, huge hole in your pocket. And then labor, and I, I have people say, of course, you know the cost of hired labor, you write the check, but what about your own labor? People say, well, I, I don't charge myself labor, uh, you know, I don't figure that in. I said, well, then come work for me. I'll pay you nothing. Oh, I can't do that. I'm so busy and I, I'm so far behind. And well, if, if you're not getting things done that you need to get done and it's costing you money, then your time is expensive. And, and so you have to figure that in. And so uh, and then insurance on that machinery. And when you add all this stuff up, what did it really cost you to feed those two bales of hay? Oftentimes the cost of feeding the hay is equivalent to the cost of making the hay. And that's the hidden hole in the bucket a lot of people just really don't realize. So um, I told you I was gonna tell you the rest of the story. So here's the rest of the story on this. Um, that calf, uh, I bought what I thought, what, uh, what I was told was were open heifers. And on New Year's Day, I drove out into my field and I saw four black dots curled up in a snowdrift. Uh, this calf and three other ones, all born the same day. And, uh, I don't ordinarily calve in January. I calve in May. And 
So wh what do you do? What do you do? I mean, you cannot treat a lactating first calf heifer like you can a cow that's being roughed along. That's going to calve in May. So these four pairs were sorted off and I fed them alfalfa hay for four months. And the rest of the herd, they were roughed on stalks. They're on corn stalks, milo stalks, and dry grass during that four months. And they received no hay, no supplement of any kind. Ridiculously cheap wintering cost for those animals. And when I went to sell those animals, my Mayborn calves weaned at an average of 816 pounds, or their sale weight. I, I preconditioned for three weeks. Their sale weight was 816. On these older calves, it was 920. And when I sold them, the average of those four calves was $20 per head more than the ones born in May. Tell me, can you buy four months worth of alfalfa hay for an animal for $20? No way. And it dawned me, it hit me right between the eyes, said, oh my gosh, this is the best argument I've ever heard from a calving. Because this calving in the middle of winter and feeding high priced hay to an animal at its peak nutritional needs is exactly the status quo in the cow business. And we do it so we can get a bigger calf in the fall. But it really is not a profitable situation. I gained really very little weaning weight, you know, 104 pounds in four months of age. That's, uh, you know, less than a pound a day of calf gain um, at, a, at a very high expense. And by not having a lactating cow in the winter time, I saved an incredible amount of money on the rest of my herd. I think we set ourselves up when we winter calf, we set ourselves up for a very high cost situation. And a lot of the things we're going to talk about from this point on will be lower quality forages that are more suited to a dry cow than a lactating cow. And, um, and we can't take advantage of them if we're calving in the middle of winter. Some we can, some we can't. So uh, moving right along, one of the absolute best overwintering forages that you can have in your system is tall fescue. And tall fescue is a grass that gets cussed all the time and for very good reason. It's one of the worst summer grasses there is available. And a lot of places, people graze it in the summer it's not a summer grass and, and uh, for more information about fescue about a month ago we did a webinar conduct a rescue from fescue we went into fescue just in depth so I won't spend a lot of time on it but fescue I took this photo um, uh, on New Year's Eve this past winter and you can see that fescue is green as a gourd this is when fescue's at its prime. And the reason more people do not stockpile tall fescue for mid-winter grazing is because they've grazed it all up during the summer and fall. There's none left, it's gone. And so the best way to utilize stockpiled fescue is to have it. And so if you're going to pull off of fescue pasture, and stockpile it, you need to have alternate forage resources in late summer and fall so that you can use fescue in the wintertime. So some of these things we'll talk about uh, are not as good as fescue for the winter, but they might be great in the fall and it allows you to, to reserve your fescue so that you can have good quality pasture in January, February, March, when, when there are very few sources of good quality pasture. And when I say good quality, if you look at the crude protein levels over there on the right-hand column, it's from Virginia Tech. Um, those protein levels are really better than probably 90% of what good quality grass hay runs. Stockpiled fescue is 
probably better quality than the hay you're feeding. In, in most cases, unless you're feeding just straight alfalfa hay, you're not seeing those kinds of protein levels in your hay. And the digestibility is, is also very good. And so, um, and one um, management practice uh, for increasing the yield of stockpiled fescue is to, of course, when you stockpile fescue, you pull off by no later than August 1st, pull off complete removal until the time you need to use it in the winter time. And at that time, you usually want to give it a shot of nitrogen fertilizer. Now, if you have a grass legume mixture, you might be able to withhold the nitrogen fertilizer, but um, there's no question that nitrogen fertility, whether it comes from legumes or fertilizer or shot of manure, poultry litter, whatever, will vastly increase your stockpile yield. And you look at this, two tons an acre of fall pasture. And this is uh, data from Missouri. So um, very similar to a lot of our, our customer base in Eastern Nebraska, Kansas, Missouri, Iowa. Two tons an acre of winter feed. That's, that's pretty significant. Now, if, um, if you have fescue already, um, you know, use it for winter pasture and find a different source of pasture for summer. Um, if you are planting fescue, and, and planting fescue is something I really promote, but if you're going to plant fescue, don't go down to the local Horselands or whatever and buy Kentucky 31. One of the bigger mistakes you can make. If you're planting fescue, plant a non-toxic endophyte fescue. We use Estancia, really like it. Here's why we use Estancia. Um, the base genetics on Estancia is high mag uh, variety, which is um, a high magnesium variety that has uh, a very low tendency to cause grass tetany in the spring. And Estancia is high mag with a non-toxic endophyte in it to make it heat and drought tolerant. It makes it tough. And you can see the difference in animal performance between Kentucky 31 and Estancia. And if I've seen any difference between the two in toughness, that additional toughness is in favor of the Estancia. It appears to me to be an actually tougher variety than Kentucky 31. Another source of uh, fall or winter grazing is crop residue. And, and a lot of people, I, I'm not telling anybody anything they don't already know here. Crop residue is uh, widely used, but, and, it, and, and it's used mainly because it's cheap. It's one of the cheapest sources of, of ruminant nutrition per day that you can find. But there's one little trick that can double the number of days that you can stay out on stocks, and that is strip grazing. If you strip graze, you can double the number of grazing days per acre that you get off those stalks. And there's hardly anything I can tell you in any agriculture endeavor where you can spend 10 minutes a day and double what you're able to accomplish off that acre. Strip grazing crop residue does exactly that. And then there's, I've seen research from Purdue, UNL, Iowa State, um, I mean, Every Corn Belt University has studied this and they found the exact same thing. When you strip graze, give them one day of grazing at a time, you double the number of days you stay out on stocks. And why is that? Well, when you turn cows out on stocks, let's say you take 40 cows, you dump them on 160 acres. What is the thing they eat on day one? What does their diet consist of the first day you turn them out? It's 100% corn. What happens when you give a ruminant that has been on a forage diet, a uh, diet of 100% grain on one day? Basically what you see in this center. We, I showed you this last week. For those of you that watched last week, we talked about what goes on inside a ruminant when they get too much grain. The inside, these are uh, little, 
cut out squares of the inside, showing the inside of different rumens. One on the left is from an animal that's been eating forage as a healthy rumen. The one in the middle, the dark one, the one that looks like it's been cooked, is from an animal that got acidosis from eating too much grain. When you let animals out on corn stalks, unrestricted, that's what the inside of the rumen looks like. And once it reaches that stage, it becomes acidic enough, it kills the bacteria that digest forage. You've made that animal incredibly inefficient for quite a long period of time. Now, when the corn runs out after seven days, now they have to digest forage. And, and in many cases, they can no longer do that very well. And so by restricting that grain intake just a little bit per day, you can, you can ration that grain out a little bit per day, enough that it gives them an energy boost, but not so much that it makes them acidic, and it can last the entire season. And you can really, really stretch it out. Now, another problem with um, crop residue, you can see the grain here. If you look at that percent crude protein on the average right there in the middle of that table, you notice the grain's about 10% protein. Plenty good for a ruminant animal. But after they're done with the grain, then what do they eat? Well, they, they eat the leaves and the husks right there. Now, if you look at the average of leaves and husks, you can see you're really pretty deficient in protein. We need at least 7% human microbes alive. You're below that, and those animals are really going to struggle because the bacteria and the rumens are going to really struggle. So when you're out of grain, you need to start figuring out somehow to get some additional protein in those animals. And one very good way of doing it is to utilize cover crops. Now, this is some uh, turnips and radishes that were uh, aerial seeded into corn at leaf drop or at, uh, at maturity. Uh, we've talked some in the past, and we'll talk some more about using um, wide row corn. And this is a picture I took up in North Dakota of 60 inch corn. And in between that, they have a cover crop blend. And that big, tall, impressive looking plant there is Bayou Kale. And I, I hope you're as impressed by that photo as I was impressed with the field when I was standing in that. I'm not very tall, but that stuff's chest high on me. And this is going into winter. I mean, there's a tremendous, there's going to be a tremendous amount of feed available after that corn is picked. And we'll probably have a webinar on 60 inch corn and some of the potential uh, benefits of 60 inch corn. And it's not to the corn itself, it's what the cover crop in between those 60 inches can do for winter pasture and for soil health. And so make sure you, you tune into that webinar. That'll be a great one. Um, some other things you can do to uh, provide fall grazing that can help you defer fescue or, or just delay digging into your hay pile is planting some things in, in August or maybe early September if you're far enough south. But this is a blend of fall planted oats and nitro radish. And uh, this uh, provided about 80 grazing days per acre. Um, uh, cow calf days per acre, and these were, were cows and big calves. And, uh, you know, that can really stretch out your winter feed supply. That can allow you to defer uh, or to delay digging into your hay. It can allow some other forages to get grown up enough, allow your fescue to stockpile, or some of these other options we'll talk about as well. Uh, the radish, of course, uh, a lot of you are familiar with radishes. This is kind of the plant that made the whole cover crop industry get, get really started. Um, and you can tell about half of that root sticks up above ground, is available for grazing, a lot of feed there. Um, and this, uh, of course, we plant radishes to break up compaction. I thought I would stick this in here. This is a picture of smart radish root. And smart radish is actually a little bit different species actually than, than the nitro radish. And uh, you can tell it's got a huge number of lateral roots off that taproot. 
I think if your if your goal is to break up compaction, uh, I'd give the, the smart radish a look. Um, it, it looks very impressive from the the root digs we've done. Some other things you can plant for winter grazing, and, and we'll probably do another webinar as, as fall starts approaching, and we start talking about winter annual. Uh, uh, of course, wheat is used a lot for winter pasture, uh, where wheat is grown, kind of a dual purpose grazing and grain crop, especially as you move farther south. Rye, rye provides more winter growth than any other crop. Um, and so if, if you're trying to get something as early as possible in spring, rye is probably your best choice. Triticale is probably next. And annual rye grass. And you can see from the picture that those are completely different plants. Um, so um, rye grass comes on later in the spring and is more, re uh, will regrow much faster after grazing than the cereal grains. Uh, ryegrass is not a cereal grain at all. Um, does not have a a big grain, big seed, you know, a grain like rye or wheat or barley. It it has very light, fluffy, grassy type seed. Uh, completely different, and they both have have use. Most of your winter cereals, though, um, produce most of their grazing in the spring, and that there's nothing wrong with that. A lot of times when you come out of winter, um, your, your hay stalks are exhausted, your, your winter grazing resources are exhausted, and having a plant, a pasture resource that will green up early, provide that early bite can be just really valuable. And then there's winter annual legumes. This is a blend of uh, hairy vetch and crimson clover. Took this on the 1st of May in 2012. You can see there is a, not only a bunch of feed, that's available there, but a bunch of nitrogen that's available. And this was a couple of weeks later, and uh, same field actually. <laughs> uh, but the hairy vetch, there, there's, there's crimson clover underneath that, take my word for it. But the vetch just climbed over it, overtopped it. And uh, I mean, there's an insane amount of both feed and nitrogen in that field right now. Now, um, one, unusual um, out-of-the-box addition to winter annual mixes for grazing. Um, this is a mixture of rye and radish that was planted in early September after a harvest of um, a short season corn variety. When you look at this, what is the highest dry matter producing plant in this field. It's not the rye, it's not the radish, it's the volunteer corn that's coming up. When you look at this, you say, well, okay, it, but it's not uniform. This is just the volunteer. How much feed could you have produced from this field if you had seeded corn on purpose along with the rye and the radish? And, and we talked last week about you know sorghum regrowth, providing a nutritional complement to the 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 low dry matter, excess protein, inadequate fiber winter annuals. That corn provides dry matter, and a low um, a low to moderate protein and high fiber, but digestible fiber, a feed source that's a perfect complement to those winter annuals. And, and look at how much additional dry matter you got per acre. And if you look at it, it, it really didn't harm the yield of the cool season grass underneath it. Not at all. In fact, you can look around there in places, it actually seems somewhat better around those corn plants. And uh, this is a, a cover crop field of mine from a few years back. And um, this, was, this is the uh, BMR corn that I put in that mix, it was planted July 22nd, and this photo was taken September 4th. So if you figure that, 12, 42 days, and that stuff is tasseling. And essentially it's you know, planted, it's planted in summer, but I mean, if you plant it in August, you'd get the same results. And, and some of those plants were seven feet tall. 
think about how much additional feed you can generate off a fall planted mix just by throwing in some cheap BMR corn or popcorn. And uh, here's an out of the box idea. A lot of people will pasture um, alfalfa, the last growth of alfalfa, you know, what, you know, you take your last cut around the 1st of September and then the fall growth comes up, freezes out and you might turn cattle into pastured off. The problem with that is that once that alfalfa goes through a hard freeze, the leaves start dropping off. You've really got about two weeks before all the leaves are dropped off of it and there's not much good to it. But if you swath that alfalfa just before that hard freeze and strip graze this off, keep it from becoming bedding, those leaves stay on the stem. They don't shatter off like they do when the plant goes through a freeze standing up. And it's amazing how many more days you can get out of alfalfa stubble simply by doing the swath grazing. And of course, you know that final growth of alfalfa is just rocket fuel as far as animal performance. Um, and because it's dried, you really don't have bloat issues on it either. So uh, I think this is a practice that a lot of people, if you're needing really good quality, late summer or, or late fall forage, uh, this could be a, an option for you. Another option that a lot of people have never thought of, um, this is uh, a plant called four ring saltbush. This is a native shrub. And what's unusual about this shrub is that um, it keeps its leaves on all winter long. And those leaves run about 16% protein. They're very palatable. Another thing characteristic of four wing saltbush is that it's, it's a desert shrub. This photo of, uh, this is in CRP uh, in the middle of winter in Southeast Colorado. We're talking 12 inches of annual rainfall here. And you can see how that shrub's about four foot tall. I mean, there is a lot of feed there. That's exceptional quality in the wintertime. And it's not the only shrub that's like that. This is another native shrub. This is one called winter fat. This is actually native to uh, parts of Western Kansas, as is the four wing saltbush, even though they're both pretty rare uh, because they tended to get grazed out very early uh, during settlement. Um, and another one, that behave similarly. This is actually an um, uh, imported uh, shrub. There's two different varieties here. The big gray looking one is one called Snowstorm and the one on the right is called Immigrant. Uh, these are USDA uh, releases and they're a plant called Forage Kosha. Now don't, don't let the, the, the name of it scare you. This is a, a very, very distant relative to the weed kosher. This does not break off and tumble, it doesn't spread and, and uh, is not invasive, it, it stays put. And it's a perennial, not an annual, but it stays green all winter long. And I've seen um, some research where putting this shrub into some arid Western rangelands has increased the winter grazing days 12 fold, believe it or not, 12 times the grazing days in winter per acre. Pretty impressive. Um, now, I want to discuss this. Native grass. Grazing native grass when it's green in the summer versus na grazing native grass when it's dormant in the winter. And if you look at the nutritional comparison, it appears there is no comparison. It, if you look at uh, ungrazed native grass in July at Time you cut prairie hay, it's about 16 or about 6% protein, 55 digestible. You let it go to frost and it's half that. You know, just, you know, we consider that worthless. You know, why would you graze that? And because we've considered that dormant grass to be worthless, we tend to eat 100% of our grass off in the summer. 
and don't even use it in the winter. We feed hay. Which of those is worth more? I want you to think about this. Which, when is this grass worth more? If you had a ton of each, ton of green grass in the summer or a ton of dry grass in the winter, which is worth more? You just look at nutritional value, animal production ability, say, well, the green grass is worth more. Okay, what's your alternative to green grass in the summertime? There's all kinds of other things you can graze in the summertime. What about the wintertime? What's your alternative in the wintertime? Hey, we've already talked about how expensive hay is. If you leave some of your grass ungrazed, and I'm not talking about reserving acres, I'm talking about the bottom half. Because we all know we're supposed to take half and leave half, and none of us ever do it because we're terrified of wasting grass. What if the, the half you leave is actually more valuable than the half you grazed? And if the half you leave replaces a ton of hay per acre, if the ton you leave replaces a ton of hay per acre, then the half you leave is worth more than the half you grazed. Are you following me? Now, the trick is, how do you make good use of that dormant forage? And it's, it's obviously not adequate quality for lactating animals. That's why it's so important in my mind to shift that calving date, shift the calving and the weaning. If you wanna utilize dry grass, you need non-lactating cows, preferably. Another thing is, is that, um, you know, how do you get this now, I'm going to go through some scenarios here. I'm going to show you how you can make a lot more money off of every acre of native grass. And what I'm showing you here is effective clipping date on carbohydrate reserves. And if you look at that graph, those two far right graphs or bars, August 1st, September 1st, you can see that when you are grazing in late summer, you're reducing the carbohydrate reserves of your grass. You're hurting it. Grazing in late summer, overgrazing especially, is the most detrimental time to that grass to graze it. So if you look at uh, this system called intensive early stocking, essentially you graze the same number of animal days per acre but you double the stocking rate and graze only the first half of the season when the grass is good, when it's at its highest quality. You look at this, uh, you look at the bottom line on the far, uh, on the two columns at right, the, the season long range um, burned on the 1st of May versus intensive early burn the 1st of May. So you're comparing apples to apples here, grazing system to grazing system. Look, they took more than 50%, 50% more beef per acre by stocking heavy and early and then resting it in late summer, letting it recover completely. Now, when you do this, you accumulate a very nice regrowth that you can use after frost. And you say, well, how does that grazing and after frost hurt it? It doesn't hurt it at all. And there's some, some more K-State research. Grazing after October 1st had zero negative impact on carbohydrate storage or the production the following year. You can't say that about the same grass grazed a month earlier in September. That was very detrimental. So simply by shifting your time of when you graze, you can double the number amount, number of animals you can carry. Now, if you do this, that means July 15th to October 1st, you need another source of forage. And so we'll talk about that as well. Now, one problem with dormant grazing native grass is that it is very deficient in protein. You need to supplement protein. Those animals need about one pound of actual protein per day supplement. Now, if you've got alfalfa hay that's 16% protein, 
That's six pounds of alfalfa per day. That's at distillers grains at 25% protein, that's four pounds of distillers per day. And research shows that if you only feed every third day, you feed three times as much protein, but every third day, so that'd be 18 pounds of alfalfa hay every third day, or 12 pounds of distiller's grains every third day, the animals actually do better than when you feed them every day. Because instead of waiting at the gate for you to show up, they'll go out and graze. They, they will graze quite a bit more if you supplement more, but less frequently. Also, when you supplement more at one time, the boss cows don't bully the, the timid cows as much. Uh, each cow tends to get more of their share. Another means of supplementing that dry grass, and this is, when I went to Africa, this was extremely common. Everybody did this. They used a, a mixture of molasses and urea. And uh, I, I would prefer biuret actually over the urea, it's much safer. But they used, you know, limited intake type tubs and they were everywhere uh, when I was there because it was the beginning of the dormant season. But the, those, those herds in Africa and Australia uh, live on molasses urea supplements with dry grass for six months out of the year. And it's, it's hardly ever used around here. Um, but my favorite source of winter protein is putting a high protein, cool season plant into that grass. Now, if you've got pristine, never been sprayed, never been plowed grassland, you know, I, I'm not sure I'd mess with that. I don't want to alter that. But what I've got here is, you know, your typical been toured on, so to take out musk thistle for 20 years um, with sweet clover in it. And this is early October, just as the grass goes dormant. And look at all that protein. That clover is supplemental protein to that dry grass. Much better than, than bringing in alfalfa hay and it's fixing nitrogen to stimulate the grass growth the next year. If you strip graze this off, force them to eat a little bit of clover and a lot of dry grass, you can get a huge amount of grazing days off of this. I mean, this to me makes an awful lot of sense. You're gonna graze dry grass in October, November. Boy, look at how slick a system this is. This is something you really ought to consider. Now we talked about if you're going to intensive early stock, rest that native range in July, August, September, so you have plenty of regrowth to graze in October, November, December. Um, what do you graze other than native range? This is where grazing summer annuals can really come in. Very handy. You, you get all this uh, uh, summer annual growth out there and it's actually better quality than the native range and uh, can provide some rest. And also you are doing your field a favor. You're doing your native range a favor by resting it during that critical time period. You're doing your field a favor by running ruminants and very productive summer annual crops across there. So this is where you can go. And people say, well, I don't need to do that. I've got plenty of grass in my pastures. I'm sure that's what this guy said too. If your pastures look like this by the 1st October, did you really have plenty of grass? Do you really have plenty of pasture? If you want to make a pasture that currently looks like this, have belly high regrowth by the 1st October that you can utilize as a grazing resource, pull those cattle off in the middle of summer, move them, to a summer annual mix on your cropland and your cropland and your pasture and your bank account will all three thank you. So um, the other thing you can do, and I showed you this picture last week, but with those summer annuals, they, you don't have to just graze in the summer. You can see here, this, this was grazed off very low, September 1st, drilled, 
cool season annuals right into the stand without, without uh, um, terminating the summer annuals. Let the regrowth come up. You can see the, the seed at the bottom of the screen. You can see all the little seedlings coming up. This was two weeks after planting. And this is after a killing frost. Look at that dry, high fiber, low protein, high dry matter, frosted off sorghum mixed in there with a very high protein, very low dry matter. And you, you can see how this just provides a perfect nutritional complement and extra yield by doing that. And so this can provide you while your animals are off grazing the, your dormant native grass, maybe with your sweet clover in it or whatever other cool season legume or cool season grass you wanna put out there, be your protein source to supplement your dry grass. While you're out there grazing that native in October, and November, this can be growing and making some feed for even later. You pull off, you run out of the native, you can go on to this and get another month or so and delay even further when you have to dig into your hay pile. So um, as I wrap up here, I just wanna uh, advertise uh, again that I do have some books for sale if you're interested in the things I'm talking about here. Uh, just send me an email and I can have a one or both of these books shipped to you. Um, the Managing Pasture, I'm asking $30 for. Drought Resilient Farm, I'm asking $25 for. Um, and that's, that's what I have uh, for this evening. Um, please uh, give us a call on, at Green Cover Seed and talk to one of our salesmen if there's something we can help you with or even just questions you'd like answered. So over to you, Noah. Awesome. Thank you, Dale. That was very insightful. Um, I learned a lot as you were talking. I kept thinking of all the cattle guys. I was like, oh, I need to send this to so-and-so. I think they would really appreciate it. So uh, as always, these are going to be recorded. So I will post this as well as the one from last week onto YouTube. So if there are people that you guys want to share this with, um, those links can be found either on our YouTube page or on our website. Uh, it's just greencoverseed.com backslash webinar. Uh, I'm going to open it up here to questions. So if you guys have any, feel free to start typing them in in the chat. Uh, to start off, I've got one here from Andy Edwards. says that uh, we are growing a winter grazing mix compiled with grazing corn, sorghum sedan, and many others. At what point of which species would you swath it to swath graze? Ordinarily, uh, I like to swath about, oh, two weeks before your average first frost. Um, the sorghums uh, in particular um, will really drop in both sugar and protein content. Sorghums are botanically a perennial. And so they're going to try to survive the winter by translocating sugar and protein down to the roots. Now there's sorghum that winter kills, so that all that effort's really kind of in vain. But if you can swath, uh, when, and I say that uh, with a caveat, um, and that's assuming you're not going to try and put a winter annual in there. If you're wanting to put a winter annual in, I'd look at uh, four to six weeks prior to your first killing frost on average. Um, if you do that, that gives you the opportunity to, to drill a winter annual between the swaths and get some good growth on that winter annual. Um, if you're not going to drill another crop in, you know, two weeks prior to your, your average first frost, try to, to cut that off so that you prevent that translocation of protein and sugar down to the roots. Okay. Uh, this question is, if planting a cool season mix into warm season grass, when is the best time to plant? 30 days before frost, 30 days after? Um, I like about 30 days before your first frost. Um, if you go too much earlier than that, there's just too much competition 
from your grass. Um, if you go later, you're just really giving up too much growing season. Um, so I, I think about 30 days prior to frost is usually usually pretty good, and it works it works best if you have you know, I talked about the intensive early stocking thing. If you're wanting to seed cool season stuff into your grass, um, the, the first time you do that, you, you probably ought to get it nipped down pretty good around that first of September, drill it in and then get off at that point. So um, now like with the sweet clover, it recedes itself very well. So that's usually a one-time planting. Um, and sweet clovers, um, even though they're a cool season plant, best time to plant those really is in the middle of winter and you can broadcast them. And they broadcast very easily, established very well, as long as they're put where there's some freezing and thawing to kind of get some frost heaving on that soil surface to incorporate the seed. And that's one of the reasons that sweet clover works well on rangeland seedings is it does not need drilled. It can be broadcast in the middle of winter. And you can do that with ground equipment or you can even do it with a plane. Okay. Um, again, we I don't have, I guess, any questions here. So if you guys have those, feel free to type them out. But I do have a question for you, Dale, in regards to mm -hmm. uh, selecting species. And you did talk about this last week a little bit, but can you touch on like the male sterile photo period sensitive forage sorghums at what point is it too late to plant those where you start looking at cool season things in your stockpile mix uh i would say um i kind of i think when you're six weeks prior to your first frost it's, it's too late to put them in um you know, which in, in my area, that's September 1st. If if I'm all, in August, I'll, I'll still throw them in, but I don't, if I'm in August, I don't get real particular about what variety or what traits. They pretty much all, you know, they're all going to get about two feet tall at that point, and um, they all act and look the same pretty much. So, you know, once you're August 15th, you know, when you're, don't, don't worry about which variety. They all pretty much work then. Um, it's when you're earlier than that, when you're more than more than two months prior to your first frost, that's when having the different traits, the, the photo period sensitive and stuff can really help you out. And if you're planting now, um, now is when having a, a photo period sensitive or a male sterile really makes a difference. As you get later, depending on what maturity, I mean, you're, you want it to freeze out before it produces grain for a stockpiled feed. Um, and as you get past the 1st of July, you can just start planting very long maturity forages, at, le at least where I am. You get into Oklahoma and Texas, uh, that might be August 1st, because your frost is going to come that much later, depending on where you are. But um, then you can just shift to longer maturity products. Um, but right now, you know, male sterile photo period sensitives are my preference. Okay, this is from Lonnie. Uh, you mentioned acidosis last week on headed out sorghum sedan. Mm -hmm. Will the daily strip grazing that you mentioned with corn work here as well? Uh, yes. Yes. Um, it, it definitely can if you've got, and I know of people in, um, I know of someone in South, Southwest Missouri, I believe it was, who uh, is wintering cattle on standing grain sorghum. Now, um, to me, that's too much grain. It's, it's pretty hard to moderate their grain intake when you've got 50% of your total dry matter is grain. I mean, it's, it's hard to keep below five pounds a day when you're only, you know, you'd have to feed them, limit them to just 10 pounds a day if that's the case. Uh, you can get a, sorghum ferments slower than corn. So um, it's a little more forgiving that way, but still that's, 
that's more grain than I'd like. Um, now, if you're doing feeder steers, go for it. I have done that before with feeder steers. I've grazed feeder steers on mature grain sorghum, strip grazed across there, and it works fantastic. It's it's very, very cheap way of, of fattening calves. Okay, uh, if you plant winter stockpile sorghum now, can you graze it once and then take the cows off and get enough stockpiled for winter? Yes. Yeah, and if you do that, you don't need a male sterile or a photoperiod sensitive. I, I would still use a BMR, and I would probably use a sorghum sedan, a BMR sorghum sedan. But if you want to do the one, uh, and a lot of people, it's very popular to take one hay cutting and then drill the winter annual in, graze the regrowth after frost, and, and then feed the hay when all that's used up. That's a very common practice, and again, you don't need a lot of bells and whistles on, on your sorghum there. I do prefer a BMR sorghum sedan, but it doesn't have to be a photo period sensitive or uh, you know any of that. You, you can get by with a little cheaper variety if that's your plan, but I still would like a BMR. So you mentioned like taking a hay cut. Are there things that you would not want in a mix like that if they are going to take the first cutting for hay? Yeah, good question. Um, I, you know, a lot of times in these stockpile mixes, I'll put okra because it holds the plant, you know, holds everything up because of the stiff stem. Put sunflowers in for the same reason. Um, sun hemp for the same reason. Um, when you're taking a hay cut, you don't want stiff stock plants in there. You know, they, they, they just don't cure well, they don't bale well. Uh, they're just, you know, they're sticks, they tear up equipment. Um, if you're wanting to do one cut and then let the regrowth come and graze it, leave those species out. Good question. So of the species that you would leave out, uh, you did talk about putting in like certain brassica plants. Would you put mm -hmm. any radishes, turnips, those things that you mentioned earlier, collards in a grazing mix? You know, if, uh, yeah, and, and those are fine. Um, the, uh, if you are going to drill cool season annuals in after that hay cutting, uh, my preference is to put your cool, all your cool season stuff in at that time. If you're, if you're not going to make it a second drill pass to put in your cool seasons, um, yeah, having some of those brassicas in there in the initial planting can be pretty useful. And, and collards, collards are probably my favorite among those because their growing point is much closer to the soil surface. Um, one problem with having radishes or turnips in something you're going to hay is that you run the risk of getting big chunks of roots in your hay bale that don't dry out and you get a big rotten spot right around each chunk of root. Okay. Well, with that, I think we'll probably wrap up here. Um, Dale, thanks again for your time. If you guys do have any other questions, uh, if you're watching this recorded uh, weeks from now, go ahead and give Dale a call or email. Dale at greencoverseed.com is shown on the screen and 785-614-2031. Again, these webinars will be recorded and put on our website and on our YouTube page. Next week, we've got Ray Ward on. Ray is going to join us to talk about a number of different topics. Um, we're going to talk about when and how to best soil sample. We're going to look at the Haney versus PLFA tests. A lot of questions we get about nitrogen contribution. We're going to talk about that uh, as well as C to N ratios and fertilizing cover crops. So excited to have Ray with us next week. Thank you guys for tuning in this week and we look forward to seeing you then. Thanks again, Dale. We'll see you all soon. Thank you, Noah.